Good morning. Still working on this series of lessons, Mending Offenses. I love that title. Something that we definitely need in the world today. We've talked about a lot of different situations, but moving on right now to Christ's ministry of reconciliation. I think this is this is where it all starts for each and every one of us as far as uh, mending those offenses. We can we can do our best on our own to try to fix things, but oftentimes when we do, we make things worse. It's song this morning, take it to the Lord in prayer. Everything that we face, everything that we endure, that's where our answers will be found. It's the answer to all that we've considered up until this point in this series of lessons can be found in the following passage of Scripture. Romans 5, 1, 2, 6, and 6 through 8. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we also have access to the Father into this grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. For when you were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Humanity has been provided with a way of escape to the condemnation that we all experience as a result of our fallen human nature. This nature is universal. No one is exempt We all face the condemnation of God simply by by being born into this world. Some may not acknowledge this fact, but that does not remove its validity. Some will deny the existence of God, but that doesn't nullify the gift that's been offered or their guilt. Yet rarely... I'm sorry. In this world, there are causes that people find important. Yet rarely are they so important that someone would die for that cause. We hear of those in far off lands who endeavor to spread the, the truth of the gospel. We also receive accounts of those in these situations who may have died for their faith. Now looking back at the first part of verse 7, I'm not familiar with any situation where someone stepped in and said, Don't kill this person, I'll take his place. Thinking of the second half of that verse, we know that those who serve in the military or in the secret service have placed their lives in great peril, and some have died to save a comrade or a leader. Although these accounts are still infrequent, they do exist. Those who put themselves in harm's way like this understand the risks and consider the seriousness of their responsibilities because of their duty, their obligation to fulfill this role. Verse 8 is unimaginable from a human perspective. Some may die for a family member or close friend. Some may even have such great respect for their political leaders that they would sacrifice themselves for the love of their country. But who would choose to suffer in the place of their enemy. Has anyone been condemned for murder and a close family member of the deceased sacrificed his own life to keep that murderer from facing the death penalty that was due him? It's often easy for parents to say that they would die for their children, but would the parent die to rescue the one who killed their child? Would a member of the U.S. US Secret Service take a bullet for the leader of of a, a terrorist government? We can't imagine those things. That doesn't make any sense. But we were all the enemies of God. These things, these are things we need to think about when we read that God commendeth His love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We were all the enemies of God. 
regardless of our background, regardless of our upbringing, regardless of our country of origin, regardless of who we are or what we've done, Jesus died so that we don't have to. Jesus died for his brother James and for Judas, his betrayer. He died for Mother Teresa and Adolf Hitler. He died for everyone who is currently serving him and for everyone who is currently fighting against him. His love for humanity is not based on ideology or geography. His compassion on us is not diminished by our sins, nor is it increased by our righteousness. He died for every one of us. He only asks that we live for Him in return. That seems like such a small request who did so much for each one of us. Getting into our commentary this morning. In our last two lessons, our study of offenses turns to the Consider, to, turns to consideration of the greatest offense of all, when mankind offends God. The scripture texts of these lessons carry a double meaning or application. They can be applied in multiple ways. The principles considered here, how Christ offered himself as a mediator between God and mankind, that he might reconcile us back to God, to his and our Heavenly Father, can be also applied to how offenses between mankind and mankind can be reconciled. The willingness to offer oneself for others that Christ has demonstrated is a core aspect of successful reconciliation of offenses. This applies, application extends, to the bound, extends the boundaries for when one would ask, how far must I be willing to go to minister to those who are offended? In this lesson, we will examine the work of Christ the Master Reconciler. In our final lesson, we'll elaborate on this point by examining the ministry of reconciliation that Christ has now left to us. And just as I'm reading this here, I'm thinking that sentence says, how far must I be willing to go to minister to those who are offended? In, in this world today, it's a sad truth that the so-called Christian world is doing more to offend sinners than to reconcile them to Christ. This should never be so. This does not serve the purpose of the ministry that Jesus came and gave to us. <laughs> this is precisely what He condemned the Pharisees for. The Pharisees were condemning those whom they didn't see righteous while they lifted up themselves as if they were, while they failed to recognize their own shortcomings. And this seems to be the majority view of Christianity today from those outside. And it's no wonder with the behavior of those who call themselves Christians when those who claim to represent Christ are the ones who are offending the lost, how are we going, how, how can we hope to actually reconcile them to Christ? How can we be a, a part of that reconciliation process if we're seen as part of the problem? How can we, be, how can we become the solution? certain man would come in after service to get on the Uber forklift mm -hmm. and people would complain that it smelled like alcohol. Mm -hmm. So someone would come in with lots of makeup and lots of perfume and people would complain to the pastor, you got to do something about it. Mm -hmm. The pastor would say he didn't know what to do about it. And this lady would come in with kids that were overweight that were constantly eating and out of control. And people would say, pastor, you got to do something about it. Yeah. 
Absolutely. We need, we need to understand and remember who we are. We have a tendency as humans to maximize the guilt of others while minimizing our own guilt. That's, once again, that's, that was the sin of the Pharisees. They, they maximized the guilt of those whom they saw as, as <clears throat> evil while failing to notice that they had any problems themselves. And I, love, I love what Paul says because it really, it really encapsulates everything that, that we need to have in our hearts as Christians when he said, neither were I already perfect, but I press toward the mark. He recognized his failures. He recognized his shortcomings. He, he acknowledged that thorn in the flesh as a benefit because through it, he was able to see his weakness and experience God's strength. If we hope to reconcile the lost, hope to be a part of that ministry of reconciling the lost to Christ, we have to be able to first acknowledge our own failings, past or present, and then understand that what God has done for us, He wants to do for them. And the only way that that's going to happen is through the love and compassion that we have because we see that that's exactly how Christ worked when He dealt with the lost. The, the ones He dealt with, uh, as I've said before, had been so hurt by the religious society that they lived in that they wanted nothing to do with God. And so they needed someone to extend that love to them. They needed someone who could recognize not only <clears throat> the failures of the Pharisees and Sadducees, but the failures of the lost. Uh, and, and be able to not only reconcile the lost to God, but to be able to reconcile the, the self-righteous to God as well. Or, yes. uh, the thing that's got to be remembered Realm is many times the argument is made, well, people are just going to be offended with Christ. People are going to be offended with the Word. Uh, and we've had lessons about both those things. Absolutely. Exactly Absolutely. Uh, and there are. Uh, but we need to make sure that when we're offering up the Word of God to somebody and they become offended at it, that they are truly offended at Christ. Right. And not, and not us. Not our behavior. Not right. Gospel. Exactly. Um, and I was thinking there is, is that sentence that you pointed out said, how far must I be willing to go in the ministry or to go to minister to those who are offended? And it talks about to offer oneself. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the reality of that statement, uh, and I haven't ever thought about it like this until just now, but the reality of that statement is if we have done as we are to do, it's no longer offering me or you. Right. But I've died mm -hmm. and Christ lives within me. Right, exactly. So therefore, it's not about crumbling me down. Mm -hmm. um, there is a humbling that has to come. Absolutely. But it's not about offering Christopher right. to somebody. It's exactly. about offering Christ mm -hmm. to that person uh, because that's who we are to be. Exactly. We take on that role of Christian. Absolutely. That's, that's something we all fail to recognize, sadly. I, often, I say, not always, but we often fail to recognize not only who we are to God and, and our offenses against God in the past, but also that we are to be Christ. That, that is our purpose. When, when Jesus left, he, I, I don't know, I think I said it something in, and last week's lesson about it, but he said it's it's not so that a a man should be above his master, but it's enough that he be as his master, and and that's our responsibility. When he left the twelve, he left them with the responsibility to carry on the work that he had started, and that work was not to tell people how bad they were unless they were in church clearly going against the Word of God. I know it says somewhat 
probably Paul because he's <laughs> the most uh, most prolific writer in the New Testament, but said, uh, who are we to judge those that, were, were, that are without? God judges those that are without. It's our responsibility to judge those who are within. If we see one another falling short, it's our responsibility to reach out to those individuals in love and point out their failures. But those who are lost, those are the responsibility of God, and it's our responsibility to love them. I heard it said, you catch them, God cleans them. And we, we don't fix people before they come to church. Uh, Brother Nick was saying, those who are in this situation coming to this church, and the individuals within the church didn't feel comfortable with them being there. It, that's what we need. And I've heard others, I've heard other ministers in the church say that. And it, it's it's a truth that's not that's off that is occasionally spoken, but very rarely accomplished. That the church should be a hospital for the lost, not a museum for the righteous. It should be a place where the lost can go in order to feel something that they can't get in the world. It should be a place where the lost be comfortable with their uh, their sins, where they can come in and feel love, where they often only feel condemnation in the world. And a golden truth. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. Therefore... As by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. Romans 5, 10 and 18. One of the most important things for us to remember is that none of us, not one of us, Brother Ard, you're a good guy. I've known you. You're probably in, definitely in this building. You're the one I've known longest in the church but I've also heard some stories about your youth. <laughs> and I know that, and that although you may have been one of the most faithful servants of God that I've known, as long as I've known you, there was time when you weren't. And that's the life of each and every one of us. It doesn't matter how new we are to the church, how, how long we've been in the church, not one of us deserves the good that God has given us. And when we remember that, then we can recognize that all of us were worthy of the death that Christ died for us because of our past actions. Our appreciation to God is shown in our willingness to treat others the same way He treated us. Think about yourself. Where were you when God called you out of your sin? Were you perfect? <laughs> Was everything right in your life? None of us were, regardless. Uh, often picked on Sister Jackie Zimmerman. She, uh, she talked about the one time she snuck out of the house when her mother told her not, she couldn't go, and she went to Chattanooga with some of her church friends to get some donuts at Krispy Kreme. And that guilt haunted her to the last the last time I heard that account, that guilt still haunted her. I, I, I hate that I did that. I hate that I did that to my mom. And that would have sent her to hell just as much as anything that any one of us have done. And we need to recognize that the power of sin is what caused us to recognize our need for God in the first place. God doesn't give us the death penalty when we turn to Him with all our hearts, even though we all deserve it. But He also gives us what we don't deserve by offering us eternal life. When we fully understand the depths of what has been done for us, then we not only will do what He did for us, but we'll have a desire to reach out to others the same way that Jesus reached out to us through His Spirit and led us to where we are today. Any comments, therefore, we'll move on to part one. Reconciliation, the answer to offenses. 
The two verses of our Golden Truth, both from Romans 5, deal with these two interrelated topics, reconciliation and offenses. Reconciliation is the answer to an offense. The term reconciled means to reestablish a close relationship between, to settle or resolve, to bring oneself to accept, or to make compatible or consistent. This clearly is the proper choice of term to describe what Christ has done for us. The entirety of Romans chapter 5 ought to be studied by everyone from that perspective of what biblical re reconciliation means. Reconciliation is required to satisfy an offense. Reconciliation has a price. It costs. It's not free. And someone must pay that cost. One theme regarding our dealing of, with offenses has been repeated over and over in these lessons. If we ever expect to satisfy the demands of an offense, we must dig beneath the superficial outward manifestations to the deeper underlying cause of the offense. Romans 5 and 12, 12 explains the underlying root cause for man's wrestling with the offense of sin every day, everywhere he turns, wherever he goes. By one man sin entered into the world. When Adam sinned, he set in motion the events of world history as we know them leading up to this very day. God gave mankind a choice. We made the wrong decision. We may want to blame Adam and Eve for their poor choice, but they were simply the pattern that humanity would follow. The fact of the matter is, if any two of us had stood in their place so long ago, we'd have made the same choice. God knew that the only way love could exist is by giving humanity a choice. Without an alternative, no choice can be made. Okay, either you can sit in a chair. Where's the choice there? There is no choice. And so it is with love. Love has to be, by its very nature, has to be a choice that we make. But God looked at that cost and decided that true love would be well worth the price that He would eventually have to pay on the cross for the sins of all humanity. The same choices that Adam and Eve had had are laid out before humanity today. And we know firsthand that we are just as poor judges of what is right and wrong as our first parents. God wanted Adam and Eve to know good and evil on His terms so that they could see things from His perspective and have a desire to make the right decisions rather than wrong. When they chose their own way instead of God's, they missed a great opportunity and all of us have been paying the price for that choice ever since then. Salvation grants us the chance to make up for the poor choices of our past so that we can be reconciled to God and make our decisions based on His understanding of good and evil rather than our own. Any comments here before we move on? I don't think we realize oftentimes how important that sentence is Right. Uh, think about a multiple question test. Uh, there are different options, but there's only one answer. Right. Uh, and we can we can have an offense, and we can deal with that on our own, and we can bury those emotions and say that we're over it and move on with life how we want. Uh, but at the end of the day, it, it never solves that offense. You, right. You cannot. You cannot over. can't overcome an offense by creating more offenses either. Right. Uh, talking about a multiple choice quiz, test, question, whatever. I, I, love, I love the way that those tests are often laid out. Because when, when you have a, a multiple choice, there are most often four answers. One of them is clearly wrong. Two of them could go either way. 
And the other one, that's up in the air. Sometimes it's clearly wrong. Sometimes it looks like it might be right. But we have a choice to make every time we recognize an offense. I can't remember precisely what Jesus said at the beginning of the quote, but he said, woe unto those through whom offenses come. He said, uh, offenses are bound to come is basically what he said. They're going to happen. We're going to be offended. And sadly, we're going to cause offenses. But Jesus says, woe unto that man through whom those offenses come. All the more reason for us to be able to recognize, acknowledge those offenses, and, and do our best to be a part of the reconciliation process, even if we were a part of the offense. <laughs> Especially if we were a part of the offense. Part two, offenses have consequences. Sin did not stop with that one man, Adam. Sin is the ultimate offense. Nearly every offense seems to spill over its or, or original boundaries of those initially involved to affect those who are nearby. For example, a dispute between two adults can easily spill over to affect their children or their parents. Though those nearby may have nothing to do with the cause of the original offense, they may still become caught up in its grasp and also suffer from its consequences. So also is the case of the offense of man's sin. Through the offense of one, many be dead, Romans 5.15. In fact, this particular offense was, far, was more, far more reaching in the damage that it caused by the offense of one judgment, one judgment came upon all men unto condemnation, Romans 5.18. Beyond Adam and Eve, the Bible contains numerous accounts of human failure and how far-reaching those failures can become. I just thought of a few. Think about Lot, Lot and his two daughters. Their poor choices created two enemy nations that would vex God's people throughout their biblical history. Saul's failure, King Saul's failure to destroy all of the Amalekites as he was instructed led to the near annihilation of the Jews in the book of Esther. And we all know the continuing saga of the results of the decision Abraham and Sarah made concerning her handmaid Hagar. We still see the effects of this single choice that two people made 4,000 years ago, give or take. These were individuals who made apparently simple choices that they thought were good decisions, but no choice is made in a vacuum. Everything we do has consequences. The choices we make today may cause those whom we love to suffer tomorrow, but consequences are not always bad things. Although we dislike the thought of Jesus dying on the cross, the consequence is that we now have the opportunity for eternal life. It's up to us to recognize the consequences of our poor decisions and turn them, turn them as well as all of our future choices over to God. Any thoughts there? Romans 5, 15 through 19, but not as the offense, so also as the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift of by grace, which is by one man Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by the one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which re receive abundance of grace and of the gift of the righteous shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's sin, one as one... For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. 
whenever others become caught up in the offense, the ultimate final solution to the offense must not only address its consequences for the original instigators, or those who were originally a part of the conflict, but for all those others who are touched or affected by the offense. This is true of all offenses, in particular, the offense of man's sin. Any comments or questions on this section before we move to part three? I have to read that pit side thing in 15 minutes, please. I'm curious. Oh, yeah. It's, it's, it, it needs punctuation. It really needs more punctuation. <laughs> Okay, the, the offense, because of one offense, many were condemned. But the free gift was the reverse. By one man's free gift, many were made righteous. Yeah, it's, 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 it's very odd wording. Definitely odd wording. It, uh, well, part of, uh, well, I will, I'll, I'll kind of say it this way. One of the things you may notice in Hebrew poetry, and clearly Paul was a Jew, um, is their repetition. So David will say something like, I went into the house of the Lord. Into the house of the Lord I went. <laughs> so it's, that repetition is a, is, a, is a common part of Hebrew poetry. And, and so I think this is a little bit of that. So he's, he's explaining the same situation in several different ways. So although you took a hold of verse 19, and wow, that makes perfect sense, more sense than the rest of it, someone else may look at verse 15 and say, wow, I didn't think about that. So I, I, don't, I don't fully understand some of Paul's wording, why it's worded some way, and I don't understand the uh, translators, why they left out so much punctuation that really would have helped the understanding. But what I do understand is that if you're hungry to receive the truth, God's going to show it to you. And, and I think that's, that's what we've experienced here in what you said. Verse 19 made it clear to you. So, any other thoughts before we move on to part three? Part three, one can, one person can make a difference. In the previous passage of Scripture, that is Romans 5, 15 through 19, certain words and phrases are repeated over and over, like we said. They describe the nature of the offense, disobedience, offense, judgment, condemnation, as well as the nature of the remedy, obedience, Grace, gift, righteousness. The last verse summarizes the matter. The offense came by one man's error. By one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. And the remedy or the reconciliation. By obedience, by the, by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. The person whose obedience would make the difference Paul had previously introduced. Romans 5, 6 through 9. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commendeth His love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. Now we also have a beautiful example and foreshadowing of the future atonement of Jesus in the account of Joseph and his um, unpleasant brothers as we studied earlier in this series. Joseph suffered at the hands of his brothers just as Jesus did. And if you look back at that account, you'll see that Judah is the one who suggested that they sell him. Judah 
is Hebrew for Judas. That, does that sound familiar? Is there possibly some kind of connection there? Although Joseph was not killed, his suffering was long-lasting and it was undeserved. This poor choice on the part of his family also had an immediate negative impact on those who thought they would benefit from their choice to rid themselves of their brother. Those who sent Jesus to his death also suffered. The sacrificial system they had lived under was put away and their temple was destroyed not long after their poor choice was made. But in the end... Both Joseph and Jesus were obedient, and by their faithfulness, many souls were saved. Through Joseph, the effect of the famine was minimized, and many lives were saved. And by Jesus' sacrifice, souls have been granted the chance to receive eternal life. It's critically important that we see the examples of Scripture for what they are. Joseph probably didn't enjoy his ordeal. But in the end, he was able to see that God was working through it all. He may not have understood why he was suffering while he was suffering. But he did his best to be the faithful servant whom God would have him to be during the worst of it. When we choose well, we can say with Joseph of our suffering as he did in Genesis 50 and 20. But as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good, to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. How many people in our lives have caused us trouble? And when we look back, we see that God was even working then. I know that in my own life I can see so many struggles that I endured. And much like Joseph, I didn't enjoy that struggle while I was facing it. But as a result of what I experienced then, God has been able to use me more effectively now because I, I know what it means to, to struggle in these areas, to suffer through these trials. And so as a result... I can be an encouragement to others just as um, Joseph was to his brothers here. They were, they were miserable because they recognized what they had done, the, the seriousness of what they had done. And they were very concerned that Joseph was going to just straight up kill them all for what they'd done to him. But he reminded them that I... I understand that it wasn't you, but it was the enemy working through you. And so many times this is something that we need to acknowledge when people come against us. There's not a human on the face of this earth whom God would consider our enemy. There are many nations that we consider the enemies of the United States. There may be many people in our own lives who don't much care for us and may try to make our lives difficult but none of them are truly our enemy. But our enemy is the one who is causing the conflict between us. Because it's not God's will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It's not God's will that there be any division, but there be unity. As he prayed in John chapter 17, not simply unity, uh, we, we believe the same thing, we're in the same church, we have the same doctrine. The, the unity that Jesus prayed for us was that they may be one as we are one. That's not just holding a, a piece of paper and say, yeah, we agree with all these things. Jesus said that we would have the same kind of unity among ourselves as followers of Christ that God the Father and God the Son had. That's a unity that's... <laughs> Well, pretty much unheard of in this world. I'm going to try to get through this last section. I may not get to the... <clears throat> yep, sure enough. When Christ came to this earth, He did not take upon Himself the nature of angels. Hmm. How far must He go? Part 4. The one who would reconcile mankind back to God could not be just any man who conducted himself in just any way. 
just how far, what sacrifices, what tests, what experiences would be required of this reconciler. The way of this man is described in Hebrews. It talks about he was a human. When Christ came to this earth, he did not take upon himself the nature of angels. Rather, he took upon himself the seed of Abraham, the nature of mankind. Why would Christ feel behooved to make to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest. Christ understood that simply paying the price, as cruel as the de his death on Calvary would be, was not enough. He had to truly understand the circumstances that mankind faced because of this offense. He wasn't just going to pay the price so that forgiveness could be given. He would also provide the way that mankind need never be trapped by this offense again. The total reconciliation required this. Consequently, Christ, who knew no sin, allowed Himself to be subjected to the temptations common to mankind. Thus, He truly could empathize with the lost state which mankind experienced. And that He Himself hath suffered being tempted, He is able to secure them that are tempted. Not only is Christ able to say to the sinner, I paid your ransom, He also can say, I feel your pain. He was the ultimate reconciler. I read an interesting account some time ago. I'm going to try to convey it as quickly as I can. I don't recall the source or the author, but at times it fits so well I have to bring it up again and repeat it. The account began with a, a mother and children who served the Lord, but the father didn't believe. His wife and kids had gone to church on a particular cold winter evening service. As he sat at home and looked at the snow blowing out, the blizzard started to rise. And he saw some birds outside. And suddenly he had compassion on these birds. And he was trying to think of a way to, to keep them from freezing in this approaching blizzard. So he, he uh, said, okay, well, I'll, I'll see if I can get them in the barn where it's warmer. And maybe I can keep them overnight and they'll be, they'll be okay to go in the morning when everything clears up. So first thing he does, he tries to go outside and chase them into the barn. Of course, they just fly off. They're birds. So, okay, well, maybe while they're gone, I'll go and open the door. So then when I, I go to chase them off, they'll, they'll fly into the barn. So he, while they're gone, he, he goes out in the barn, and he opens the doors and goes back inside and waits for them. And they come in, come back and start landing and pecking around on the ground looking for, for food. And he opens the door of the house and runs back out, tries to chase them into the barn. They fly off. Okay, what can I do? I, I, I've got some, I got some corn here, some dried corn. I'll go ahead and just uh, make a trail and kind of lead them into the barn. So I'll put a big bag of corn in the barn and, and they'll just, uh, that way they can go into the barn. Then I can shut the doors. So lays out the trail of corn into the barn. Birds come and they just peck around in the corn. They don't follow the trail to the barn. They just peck around the corn stuff that's in, on the ground. And, and he looks out and he says, I, I wish there was something I could do. Uh, why, why can't I get those, if, if, if only I were a bird, then I could tell them there's safety in the barn. And it hit him. That's why Jesus became a man. That's why God became a man. He couldn't chase people to his will by giving them a law. He couldn't lead people to his will by giving them good examples. He had to become one of us to, to, so that we could comprehend what He was trying to say, who He was. He is the author of reconciliation and He wants everyone to be reconciled to Him. And He said once again, well, it, it is said, it's not God's will that any should perish, any, but that all should come to repentance. And the only way that's ever going to happen is through reconciliation. And we are left here as the instruments of His reconciliation. If, if only we'll play that part.